and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Kate Humble. And I'm Ben Fogel and we've come up to the lion enclosure to meet Charlie's bride. <laughs> just look, if we go down here, you'll see Charlie just at the end there. Not particularly happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be meeting lots more animals here at Longleat as well as bringing you stories from the house and the estate if we get out of here alive. <laughs> Here's what's coming up on today's programme. A widowed otter is desperate for love, but can they find her a mate? One of the big troubles we've had with her at the moment is she's always out looking to us. She hasn't got a partner to enjoy spending time with. We go back 30 years to hear how the chimps escaped to the mainland. The boat had gone and the chimp was gone. The chimp was <laughs> rowing back across to the mainland and the fellow was stuck on the <laughs> island. And how will the keepers cope when I break down in the tiger enclosure? Hello, could you just come up the track at the moment? Right. OK, thank you. Yeah, we've just got a tiger coming over. But we're going to start down in Pet's Corner, where Rosie, the Asian short-clawed otter, is feeling lonely. It's several months now since her partner Johnny died, but it's been hard to find her a suitable new mate, and keeper Rob Savin is struggling to keep her entertained. One of the big troubles we've had with her at the moment is she's always out and almost looking to the green jumpers, looking to us. She hasn't got a partner to enjoy um, spending time with. She hasn't got another, another otter. And I think when she has got another otter, she'd be spending half her time with the otter or more, doing, doing things like playing together, feeding, grooming, mating, hopefully. And it'll be great. Rosie. Today, he's brought one of her favourite foods as a special treat. Uh, we boil these up for them. Um, sometimes we just feed them raw. This is something you might find eggs in nests uh, in the wild. Uh, they, they'd raid nests and find eggs. They'd eat all sorts of things. To be honest, uh, Asian short-clawed otters are, are opportunist feeders. Um, you would associate otters with normally eating fish, but a uh, very small amount of fish this, this species eats, to be honest. They, they eat things like clams, uh, crabs, mollusks, insects, uh, small rodents, uh, frogs, frog spawn, anything they can get their hands on, really. Most otters live alone, but Asian short claws pair off for life, so Rob has been especially keen to find the right Mr. Right for Rosie. At last, we've got some good news. Um, we've been waiting a little while now, but we're going to get another mail for her. We found one long, at long last, and I'm, I'm glad to say very, very soon, next couple of days, um, I'm going to go and get him. He's a young male. He'll be a lot younger than her, so I'm sure she won't mind too much. Uh, she's just about six years old now. This one, we believe, we're not 100% sure, but we believe is going to be around one and a half. They should hopefully get to know each other. They get, get a good bond and uh, fingers crossed it'll all work out well. Although Rosie is old enough to be his mum, she's still in her prime as otters often live to over 20 in captivity. Her new beau has also grown up in a wildlife park, but the head of Pets Corner, Darren Beasley, still can't be sure they'll get on. I think probably the, the biggest concern I've got now as, as keeper um, is this, the actual mixing, the initial, when we mix male and female, we mix Rosie with the new man. Um, mixing animals, you never know how it's going to go. And I think, to be honest, when we mixed Rosie with, with old Johnny, uh, the last male, it went so well, we were rather spoiled. You know, it was love at first sight, fantastic pairing, brilliant bond. You can't always hope they're going to go... Well, you always hope they're going to go well, but you can't believe they're always going to go well. So I think we'll, we'll look. The mixing, get over the mixing, get over the first 48 hours. Uh, and then go from there. As with any blind date, everyone's a bit nervous about how it will go, but the young Romeo will be here any minute now, so we'll soon find out. A few months ago, the head of the giraffery, Andy Hayton, went out to Kenya with several other keepers to study animals in the wild. He was particularly interested in the eating habits of the Rothschild giraffes, which are the same kind he looks after in the safari park, and it gave him an idea. These bushes, to a point, are a little bit like hawthorn. Um, and what would be nice to try is if we could start some, you know, small areas 
or large areas of planting hawthorn in the, the say the giraffe reserves get them established and allow the giraffes to browse as soon as Andy was back in England he went around the estate finding all the hawthorn bushes there were plenty to choose from so what we're going to do is we're going to take these hawthorn out right because they're quite a thorny bush right up in there it's quite oh, a savage yes. thorn yeah you can see surely so, the giraffes don't want to eat this though well I mean we've we we knew for years, you know, giraffe eat acacia and acacia have spikes on. Right. Um, after going out there, we know quite how savage acacia thorns are. I mean, they're like this long, really, really nasty. So this is really good environment, which for giving the giraffes browse anyway. Yeah. And hanging it up is really good. It's, it's natural. Giving them something like this, it takes them twice as long to eat it because they're working their way around the thorns. So did you actually see giraffes in Kenya? Eating acacia thorns. Yeah, eat, oh, eat, eating from acacia, yeah. But the, there's a really cool bush. They call it the whistling bush. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it grows. It's a form of acacia. It grows these little buds, right. little black buds yeah. that ants move into. So every time you tap them, the more these ants pile out and attack anything that starts wow. touching the bush. It's just like a defence mechanism. They live totally together, this bush and the ants. So we need to cut this one I'll down. I'll take this one down and try okay. not to spike myself on Ow. it. Ow! Too much, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we really wouldn't want to eat one, would you? <laughs> no, you really wouldn't. I'm amazed that they're able to, to cope. I mean, they obviously have quite tough mouths, do they? I mean, they're just, yeah, they're just so well adapted to eating what they eat. Yeah. Every animal kind of has to adapt to what it, what it does. Um, and, and it's good, we, but we have to tie these up really well because we don't want uh, camels or anything treading on them. Right. Because camels have got quite quite soft feet. Oh, of course. Cool. So you've got to watch out for the thorns for the other animals in there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take this big one. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to, what, go and deliver it to Ben and Ryan are up in the reserve, are Yeah, they? we'll go and give it to them. OK, they it well, we'll take it out. <laughs> <laughs> this could take some time. Go on, Andy, push! <laughs> It's a big day down at Pet's Corner. After scouring the country for months, keeper Rob Savin has finally found the perfect mate for Rosie the Otter, and today she'll be meeting him for the first time. He's a real cute boy, this one. We've, uh, we've got him no problems at all. Here he is. Now, I don't know, he's a bit nervous and a bit shy because he is only very young from the... Uh, from the paperwork we were given from Cotswold, he's one year and two months old, so he's a very young young male. And he's a little bit shy at the minute, but uh, so far, so good. He's had a long journey, so it'll be nice to get him in. The first step is to put the travel box in with Rosie, but with its door still firmly shut. She knows something's going on. Rosie does, uh, she's, she's a very nosy girl, um, but she's also a little, bit in, a little bit scared, a little bit wary when there's stuff going on. She's, I can see her looking towards the, the, the tunnel that links the night house with, with the outside of the enclosure. She, she could hear something going on in there. She knows there's something there, but she should be able to smell him as well. I mean, male otters, they do pong an awful lot. To, to, ro to Rosie, it's going to be a very attractive smell. So she's, she's drawn by that. She wants to go and check it out, but um, she's also a little bit scared as well. Although the two Asian short-clawed otters should get on, the keepers can never be too careful. Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner wants to make sure everything goes smoothly. A bit of fur could fly. A lot of the time what you've got to do is let that take place and only stop it when it gets too bad. Um, and a lot of the time, otters just get on fine. And literally, we've just got to wait and see. The other thing is, of course, if they get scared, they don't always know where the house is. Because usually when they're frightened, they go home and they feel safe. Which is why we'll have members of staff dotted round behind us here. So when they do come out, if he does get scared for any reason and he decides to jump this way, we're there to stop him. But before they go outside together, Rob needs to make sure that Rosie doesn't attack her new mate when he comes out of his travel box. Here we go. I'm going to let, shut the door for safety a minute and then let her back in. Here we go, she's going to grunt. She can see the door's open now. Oh, he's coming out. He's very, very wary. The next few minutes are absolutely crucial. 
Rosie will either caress him or try to kill him. We'll come back to see what happens. Right, we've brought you some brows. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've done all the hard work. We have, um, and we're going to keep an eye on the giraffes and keep you safe. OK, and the camels, please. Yes, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I'm here, as you can see, with Keeper Ryan Hockley. And, Ryan, um, we've actually got to lift this stuff up, do we? I'm afraid we do, Ben, yes. Okay. And as you can see, it's uh, very... Uh, very prickly. Very prickly, indeed. So, literally, we're going to hoist this up onto, onto here. That's right, yeah, we... Uh, we come out here every day um, when the browser is available, Ben, yep. and use these browse hangers. That we've we've put these in specially and dotted them around the giraffe reserve. So how high does this lift it? Um, well, this is probably. I mean, that's got to be not far off. What, 25, 25 foot, I'd say, Ben. So it it recreates, you know, what's happening in the wild. And how do the how do the camels react to the to the spikes and the barbs on this? They're quite tough, you know, these they... camels. Yeah, they'll. Uh, it's almost like they'll eat anything. They'll cut their nose off to spite their face, really. <laughs> cool, cool, Should I hold that back a bit? <laughs> Please, Ben, yeah. Now, this really does have very sharp points on it. I, how on earth do the giraffes manage to digest all of that? What giraffes do is um, they're permanently producing a lot of saliva in their mouth, and they have a very hard uh, top palate. Yeah. So what they'll do is they'll carefully pick away at the leaves and the thorns, and... Uh, they basically make a, a big uh, spitball with them. They're, they're constantly working it against their hard palate right. uh, with the saliva, and they sort of end up with like a, a ball of it, really, in their mouth. And then with all the excess saliva as well, it makes it very easy to swallow. So, I mean, they can really take some fiercely sort of thorny stuff, and, and it doesn't doesn't really bother them whatsoever. And presumably this kind of empty bunch here is, is one they, they ate earlier. <laughs> this, yeah, this is what we hung out yesterday, but um, this wasn't anything thorny. This was beach that right. we hung out yesterday. And I, and I have to say, they have these incredible big black tongues. Do you, have you any idea how long they are? Uh, they're about a foot and a half long, no 18 inches. So, uh, you know, but as you can see with this thorny stuff here, it's very important you know, for reaching up, um, getting in between thorns, pulling out some really sort of juicy, succulent leaves. Uh, if they didn't have that tongue, there was, there'd be no way that they could sort of browse the way that they do. Really amazing. And we've got some... The camels can still reach. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> Only the bottom bits, though. The, the, the um, giraffes still They're have great the, hoovers. the upper hand. Everything that them. shakes off, they just come and sort of take all that. Mm -hmm. So. And they obviously get along with the giraffes in here. Yeah, you never really see any sort of aggression around the brow. Sometimes the camels get a little bit jumpy mm -hmm. and, and sort of run around, but uh, you never see too much aggression out of the giraffe. Mm -hmm. Ben, if you just carry on winding it up Excellent. for me, lovely. Right, well, Ryan, thank you very much for letting us help you out. I'm going to winch this up. <laughs> camels enjoying that. Enjoy this, giraffes. The lake beside Longleat House is extremely unusual. Nowhere else in the world will you find African hippopotami living cheek by jowl with Californian sea lions, never mind a pair of elderly gorillas with their own island and a filler complete with satellite TV. It all began in 1966 when the safari park opened. The first head warden, Mike Lockyer, remembers trying to sort out who should live where. It was a bit of an experiment because uh, in the natural state, the sea lions of California would never meet African hippos. Um, it was all a learning curve and that was part of the, the fun and the excitement and the <laughs> every day is different. You didn't know what was going to happen next. Many of the first sea lions they put in the lake came from zoos, so they were already very tame, too tame sometimes. <laughs> Nowadays, the keepers use bigger boats, and although this generation of sea lions has been left more to themselves, they're still full of fun. Mike Lockyer has come to meet Mark Ty, the keeper who looks after them now. So the, the sea lions are still with, in with the hippos. They get on all right? Yeah, very well, actually. I, mean, I, think, I think the hippos have grown a bit weary of them jumping on their backs, but they kind of just got to accept it that, yeah. you know, they, they've given up to it now. Do the hippos still get on the island? No, no, not, 
now we've got an electric fence and the, the sides are not sort of very sheer, so now they yeah. don't go up. And they, they, I remember in the early days when the hippos used to get on the island mm -hmm. and the big male chimps you had then used to run along by the side of him, batting him on the back <laughs> like this and chase him off the island. I, I never understand why this hippo didn't turn around and snap at him, but he no. never did. He just made straight for the water and, and away. Hippos may look placid, but they're actually one of the most dangerous animals in the world. Despite being vegetarian, they kill hundreds of people in Africa every year, and they have a particular reputation for attacking small boats that enter their territory. Lord Bath didn't know that when he bought a new sailing dinghy. I was bullied into getting a boat by my children. Um, well, it's not quite true. I think uh, no. I think I got it in my head. They were sort of saying it's a ridiculous thing to have. But anyway, having got it, I better try it on the lake. Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner was a junior keeper at the time, and he couldn't believe his eyes. I mean, literally, I just came along the top road, and I could see a sailing boat out in the lake. First instinct was I couldn't believe anybody would go onto a lake with a boat like that with hippos in and it turned out to be the now law bath. So I went out there and the boat had a will of its own and kept on going towards the island and, um, you know, trying to tack it and um, uh, make the boat move in the direction I wanted didn't, I didn't seem to be very good at that and it just went closer and closer and closer. So I said to the boat, you know, you'd have to tell him to get off. They said, we can't, it's Lord Bath, son. I said, it doesn't really matter who it is because if the hippos, which were in the lake, get near the boat, they'll sink it, and he'll be sunk. Lord Bath was escorted back to dry land by one of the pleasure boats, and he never tried sailing on the lake again. But of course, in those days, everyone was learning by experience. Nico and Samba have been living on the island for nearly 20 years now, but back in the 1960s, finding the right species to put there was something of a lottery. At one stage, they tried baboons on the island, um, and they all swam away, they all swam off. Um, we knew they could swim, but we didn't think they would probably go that distance. But anyway, that didn't work. Um, then we had chimps, of course, because um, chimps really do not like water at all, and uh, they don't, don't go into it unless it's <laughs> a very, very good reason. <laughs> Chimps may not like water, but they're one of the most intelligent primates, and they learn fast. They were put on on a daily basis and taken off, and they, we would put them in a boat, row over, put the chimps on the island for the day. The only funny incident I remember about that is one day when the chap was on service in the island picking up rubbish and what's it, and he looked around, and the boat had gone, and the chimp was gone, and the chimp was <laughs> rowing back across to the mainland, and the fellow was stuck on the island. <laughs> It was quite amusing, the idea that the chimp had worked out, well, this is what you do. You get in and you unhook that bit of rope and you row and off you go, and that's what it was doing. Fortunately, the chimp didn't get far, but over the decades that followed, some of the lake animals did manage to escape. It's a keeper's worst nightmare, especially when the animal weighs over two tonnes and has a nasty reputation, as we'll find out later on. Right from the beginning, the safari park was intended as a drive-through experience. Nearly five decades later, half a million people visit Longleat every year. So it's hardly surprising that the odd car breaks down. And that's when you remember that the animals around you really are wild. So what happens if you break down in the middle of the tiger enclosure? Well, fortunately, the keepers here are well-versed in the recovery of vehicles, and it all begins by doing this. By pressing the horn, I've called in keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope, and I'm going to simulate a car that's had a burst tyre. Hi, guys. Are oh, you yeah. my knight in shining armour? <laughs> <laughs> what seems to be the problem? <laughs> it seems that my tyre is flat on okay. the front here. So how on earth do we do this with the tigers out and about? Well, the first thing is Brian will get out with a gun, right. give us a guard, and then I will get out and change the wheel. <laughs> Obviously, for safety reasons, you'll have to stay in the car. OK. Um, 
and we'll see what we can do. Now, obviously, this is a simulation, but this presumably happens... It does happen. From time to time. Um, it's mainly, more often than not, um, overheats and general little breakdowns, but we do on the odd occasion have a, a puncture or whatever. So this is just a practice for us. And are you, uh, are you a good tyre changer, if that's the term? I'm not the quickest. <laughs> <laughs> not. But I assume in the middle of a Tiger enclosure like this, you want to be pretty quick. Pretty quick, and obviously safety is paramount. Um, so we will obviously have to do everything carefully. I won't get out until Brian says it's fine. For me and, and you wouldn't put the Tigers in? Not for something like this. Um, obviously, if we had a, anything like a car fire, then first thing is occupants out, Tigers in. OK. OK. Right. The only thing is, they're down there. I can't see them very well, just let you know. Right? Yeah. Do you always want, is the idea to always have your eye on both the tigers? Yeah, better, so you know exactly where they are. We're blocked with the uh, shower at the moment, so we're going to have to be very careful. Okay. We'll come back to see whether Bob can get my wheel changed before the Bengal tigers realise that I'm a sitting duck. Down in Pet's Corner, Rosie has just met her new mate for the very first time. Everyone's hoping that they'll hit it off because no baby otters have been born here since the 1970s and keeper Rob Savin would love to see that change. They're just about, yep, yeah, they've touched nose and she's just about got a smell of him now properly. Yep, yeah, he's in the tunnel and she's making little grunting noises at him. I presume she's just about to lead him right outside. It may only be their first date, but Rosie clearly likes the look of her new partner and Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner is on hand to shoot the wedding photos. There you go, look. Kissing. We're getting on well, look. Coming over nearer and nearer all the time. She's leading. She's showing him where it is. And yeah. They tend to interact more when they've just met. Later on, once he's got to know her, he'll think, oh, it's just another girl, he's not bothered about her anymore. He'll forget her, he won't do all the lovey-dovey. All the chocolates and the cakes will go out the window. So this is where they're all being smooching and loving at the minute. So that's why I'm here, to get all the smooching shots while they're good. It's looking really, really good. It's, it's, as, it's as best as I can expect it to be. I'm really happy. It, it almost looks as if they've always been together. Um, apart, you know, all, all that's happening is that they're, they're getting to know each other very, very quickly. And I'm glad to say there's no signs of aggression towards each other at all. It looks like they've, they've really clicked. The young couple have clearly hit it off, and Ian hopes that one thing will inevitably lead to another. It's probably about 30 years since we had otters, baby otters born here. So uh, it'll be fingers crossed for these two. It'd be just nice to have babies. Everything's nice for, you know, you get baby ones, but it's nice to have baby otters. Back in the tiger enclosure, keepers Bob Trollope and Brian Kent are ready to tackle my flat tyre, if the tigers will let them. So, Bob, Brian's getting out now and he's, yeah. he's going to be armed, is he? Yeah, he's got the gun. Um, I won't get out until he says it is safe to. Right. So we just, the tigers are just behind the shelter, so it's actually even more dangerous because we don't know where they are. Now, cats are renowned for their curiosity. Is something like this the sort of thing that they'd want to come oh, over and investigate? Oh, they will do. As soon as they see someone out, obviously, um, that means that there's something to investigate. So, more likely, Kadu would be the one that comes up. Right. OK? okay. Is that right? Yeah, ready when you are. Right, let's go. Get the spare ready. What's the kind of worst incident that you can remember happening here? Uh, Are there any that stick in your mind? Look, here we go. Up. Yeah, Just one of the worst incidents was actually a car. Oh, I think Brian's... Pop. Hello. Caduce coming up the track at the moment, all right? OK, thank you. Yeah, we've just got a tiger coming over, okay. investigating. Uh, one of the worst incidents was actually 
uh, car catching fire. Really? And unfortunately, the occupants couldn't get out straight away because all the electrical systems locked the door. And that's uh, a sort of worst case scenario was, anyway, in the middle. And were they in, in the Tiger they or the They were actually case? here, well, on this spot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That doesn't bode well, Bob. <laughs> So what did you do? How on earth did you? Um, well, put the fire we were out? lucky enough because every whenever there's people in here, public, and there's always a person in mm -hmm. here to keep an eye on them more than anything. And um, we were able to very quickly get over there. And fortunately yeah. enough, they banged the door and it's gone oh, away. And they've just jumped into the vehicle. Um, Sit down. Say. And then obviously we called the emergency services for something like that. There's the tire off. Excellent. I chuck it in the back. Doing a very fine job here. Good you nice can get a job doing this, I think, Bob. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> so, are all the are all the keepers here trained up in um, in the art of of um, recovering vehicles? We do um, have dummy runs on the odd occasion, just to keep them in, you know, in check with everything. Mm -hmm. um, something that we do practice from time to time. I'll just tighten them up finally, and then. Are we all hopefully, done? Hopefully you'll be on your way. Excellent. Well, Bob, thank you very much for saving me. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I'm glad I'm not stuck in the tiger enclosure all day. Bob, thank you. Thank you. I'm out in the pig enclosure with keeper Luke Magruder and a very happy-looking Bruno and Blossom. Luke, I've never noticed this before. They actually wag their tails. Yeah, they do. And they wag their tails for exactly the same reason as a dog will wag its tail. Really? It's just Yeah, it just means they're content. But you'll notice that they've... Because uh, they're pot belly pigs, they've, they don't have curled tails. Like People always think pigs have got curled tails. They've actually got oh, straight nice. tails. It's one of the signs of a pot belly pig at that. That sort of thing. Now, um, just sort of looking around their enclosure, there are lots of different areas. They've got lots of different areas. Obviously, sort of mud and wood. Why do you have the wood down here? Uh, the wood's for them to... It, it's enrichment. It's, it's what they do in the wild, and it's, they just like to chew away at the wood. And, right. You know, not, re not really to eat it, but just, just because they like chewing away at it. They may find, you know, they may, may find an insect or something in there. Right. But it's, it's really just to chew it, and it keeps their teeth in good condition. And the other curious thing, if we can go over here, is this bizarre slab of concrete. Is this just a kind of odd thing that happens to be in the enclosure, or is it here on purpose? No, it's, it's here on purpose, and it's to wear down their, their feet. Yes. If you look at the end of their feet there, yeah. it would overgrow, and they, they would actually cross, and oh, it, would, right. it causes a lot of pain for the pig. They'll get stones stuck up in there, so it's important we keep them nice and fold. It's just the same as a, a fingernail, really. Well, thanks very much, Luke. It was great to see them. And here's what else is coming up on today's programme. We'll flash back to the day when a hippo nearly caught a keeper. I heard a snort. I turned round and one of them was running. It looks like love in the fast lane for the amorous otters. Certainly within the first 24 hours, he has tried to, to make her already. And she didn't mind at all. And the butterflies are beautiful, but how can they compete with the magnificent new moth? That one? Yeah, is that's that, new. That... We've been waiting for that one to happen. It looks like it's pretend. It looks like a, a cardboard cutout. No, it's the Madagascan moon moth. But let's start with those hippos. When they first surfaced in Half Mile Lake back in the 1970s, few people realised just how dangerous they can be. The problem is that they're aggressive, they weigh over two tonnes, and they know how to throw their weight around. But because of their slightly comical appearance, it's easy to think they're harmless. It's not a mistake that keeper Mark Ty will be making again. We had Hippo locked in the house here, and it was all a little bit different then. And I was, had come round to feed her, and we sort of basically used to throw her food over the fence. And the other two hippos, Spot and Sonia, were underneath those two trees over there, which at the time I figured was quite a, a safe distance, sort of perfectly OK. And I was merrily throwing the hay and shaking it up over the side of the fence, and I heard a, a snort. I turned round, and one of them was running. You know, you kind of think, that's all right, she'll stop. And I thought, no, she's not. I started running towards the truck, which is just over here, not very far away, and in the time it had taken me to go from there to the truck, she'd done the whole distance 
through thick mud and water up to where I'd been standing. From then on, I had a very healthy respect of what a hippo is capable of and how fast they can move. And I was very scared. And I just kind of think if I'd have tripped over, fallen, that would have been it. It was a close call for Mark. But at least the hippo didn't get out of the safari park that time. Back in 1970, one had got clean away. And ex-head warden Mike Lockyer remembers that fateful day very well. In those days, um, the lake wasn't as well shorn up as it is now. And uh, it was relatively, I suppose, easy for them to get out and go walk about. And when one was missing, and uh, an animal that's quite used to people shouting and saying, come on, come on, give them a loaf of bread and that sort of thing. If suddenly one's missing, you think, well, where's that one? And, um, you know, that's where <laughs> we start looking further. And as the time goes on, you think, it's gone. About a mile upstream from the safari park is the estate village of Horningsham. Steve Crossman has a farm there. I came out one morning to check my cows. Uh, about half past seven. I was walking down where I was walking now, and uh, I came to the gateway, and I noticed there were some very strange and odd-looking uh, footprints on the ground. And uh, they obviously weren't anything to do with my cattle. So um, I went and got farther, and we had a look, and we couldn't quite work out you know, what was going on. And we followed the tracks, and they went up to the pond, up at the top there by the bridge, Something quite large, obviously, gone in the lake and then sort of moved around and moved down, came back down, and then the footprints went back down there. Strangely, the trail led right back to Steve's farmyard. We had a phone call, I think it was from someone called uh, Crossman down at the farm, here, who said, oh, got your hippo down here, I've shut it in the yard. Well, of course, he'd shut it in the yard in the same way that he would shut cows in a yard by simply closing a, a wooden five-bar gate. So we went rushing down there and uh, th there was a sort of hinges on one side and the gate latch on the other and a more or less hippo shape in the middle where he just walked straight through it. Um, and eventually ended up in this wood here and then came back down into the lake again because all really interested in getting back to the water and or coming out for grazing. They broke a couple of fences. They, they come through a barbed wire fence. There's nothing to a hippo. So, uh, but they didn't cause any lasting damage and uh, caused a bit of a laugh and a bit of a stir around the village, but it was just a one-off, I think. But that wasn't the last daring escape from Half Mile Lake. A few years later, another animal got much further and caused a considerable commotion, as we shall see. Despite the fact that I've already collected half of forest to feed the giraffes today, head of section Tim Yeo has roped me in to helping him with a job up in the new area. What we've we've got here is uh, a post bonker that we it's rather heavy that we're is, struggling yeah. with across <laughs> the park here and uh, an untreated post right uh, of which uh, we want to put the salt lick that you are carrying yeah uh, and, and in order to do that we need to just put this post in the ground just okay. maybe just here where they can where they can see us so uh, this is okay. basically putting a putting a salt lick in specifically for the bongos Specifically for the bongo, yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Should I, can, should I yes, hold that up? So we just be smash if we, it. Up. We just hit the bang. What a clever thing! I've never seen one of these before. Bongo is, look isn't it? In yeah. the least bit concerned. <laughs> a few more hits there, Kate. Okay. Probably. That will probably is do. That right? <laughs> so this is the the salt lick. Put that one on. And do you want to just slip it on over the top like that. That's lovely. That's lovely, Kate. Okay. Yeah. Look now. Is this the sort of, I mean, it's obviously it's a, a very different colour from the sort of salt that we're used to. That's right, I mean, yes. is, it, is it the same sort yes. of salt? This is totally unrefined uh, salt, pure, right. pure salt. I mean, it's had nothing done to it here. But because uh, I, mean, I thought salt was bad for you. I mean, we're constantly told, don't eat too much salt. That's right. Uh, the animals themselves know how much they need to take. I mean, so they can regulate right. their own balance. Exactly. They find salt 
when they require it. Right. Um, so they're not like us, you know, oh, we'll have a bit of salt on here. and we'll have, Cover our we... chips in salt. Exactly, yeah. you know, even though the thing's been cooked in salt. So, right. Um, so I think that's where it's a, it's a little bit different, really. And, I mean, in the wild, clearly there isn't somebody like you wandering around the African forests that bongos <laughs> live in putting up salt licks. Will, exactly. they, will they be able to seek it out? Is it something that will occur naturally in the ground and that sort of thing? It is. They will know where they can find it, yeah. incredibly. And I think with, with, um, with animals, they, uh, much like us, once they've learnt where there's a source, they'll pass that down generation oh, really? after generation and generations. Do you give it to our English deer? Because, I mean, I'm sort of thinking mm. in hot countries where you sweat a lot and you lose a lot of salt, is it yes. something that just sort of tropical deer require or is it something that all your hoofed animals require? It really is something that, yes, that, that all of ours require at some point or another. Well, let's hope that the um, bongos like it and, and shall we clear this stuff away and, uh, and let them see if they discover it? Okay. Thanks, Tim. Right, I've got this. Oh, where's the ton? <laughs> <laughs> Earlier on, we heard about a chimp escaping across Half Mile Lake in a rowing boat and a hippo who nearly caught a keeper. But the most notorious breakout happened in 1988, and it's a day that head warden Keith Harris will never forget. Every morning, all the staff in all the different sections go off and do a head count. So uh, the, the people that were looking after the lake at the time came down, counted the sea lions, noticed one was missing. Keith guessed that she'd nip down the stairs towards the river. Normally, the water comes over and cascades all down this concrete. We think that she came down into the stream, and this stream goes into the River Froome. So we thought, oh dear, we've, <laughs> we've got a chase on our hands. The fugitive was a female called Laddie, and by now, she could be anywhere between here and the Bristol Channel more than 30 miles away. But the first report came from the town of Froome, only three miles downstream. Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner set off in hot pursuit. We got a call that a sea lion had been spotted in Froome, which obviously was a bit of a weird thing. Uh, so we rushed down here to see if we could see it, uh, and there was nothing. Um, I spoke to a member of public was here, and he said the sea lion was last seen swimming that way. We couldn't quite believe what was... Uh, was going on, but well, we had a really good look round here, um, and literally now the chase was on to try and find out exactly where she is now. We had to try and follow her as best we could, which is not too easy, because she can move a darn sight quicker in the river than we can getting around the roads. We were just looking at every stream we could. We called in people's houses, knocking on people's doors, and we see the sea lion, which obviously some people thought we were, you know, from a funny farm. <laughs> And we went to this uh, house and we said, have you seen a sea lion? He said, well, there's a bloke down fishing at the bottom of our trout farm. And he said he saw the sea lion there and it grabbed this massive big trout and was just playing with it. Um, and literally, we went and saw the bloke and he said, yeah, he just came swimming along. I'd been here fishing for hours and caught nothing. Sea lion comes up and grabs this massive great fish, plays with it, throws it to one side and just carries on. At this point, we're starting to get worried, you know, because she could end up following this river all the way, and this eventually goes to the sea. So you can have a sea lion, and once it's got that far, we'd never have a catcher. So, I mean, this was starting to get, you know, quite a bit of tension and a bit nervous now, because she's just going. For two days, there was no sign of Laddie. Was she lying low, or had she got clean away? Then Keith got a tip-off. We um, had a phone call that she was in an or ornamental pond in Trowbridge. How she got there, we, that bit we don't know, but she'd obviously followed a stream somewhere along the line. By now, Laddie's breakout had hit the headlines. This is the BBC local news report from the 7th of July, 1988. After swimming more than 17 miles, helping herself to fish on a trout farm and commanding the attention of a crowd of spectators, Laddie the sea lion wasn't about to give herself up easily. Are you optimistic that she's going to come back? Oh, we'll get her sooner or later. It might be an all-day job, but uh, sooner or later she's coming back. Her pup, Lindy, was brought in to try to tempt her over but it didn't work. Eventually, she sat on the side of a culvert. So what we did is we pushed her off, and then we were able to push her in the box. At the time, I mean, we were so relieved that we got her back without any injury or, or damage to her. 
Um, and I think in some ways she was relieved to be back. As soon as we put her back out with the other sea lions, she was fine. To discourage any further sea lion excursions, an electric fence was installed. The sea lions have got extremely sensitive whiskers, probably one of the most sensitive whiskers of the animal world. And when we put the electric fence there, I, to this day I don't think one's actually touched it. Their whiskers are actually telling them that that is electric and they don't go near it. So it's, it's actually been very effective. Half Mile Lake is so much an established part of the landscape here that it's hard to believe it isn't a natural feature at all. In fact, the first Marquis of Bath had seven lakes dug out in the valley 250 years ago. According to the land agent Tim Moore, they followed the line of an existing stream. The name Longleat comes from the Long Leet or stream. And you can see, looking up here, the stream that flows through the valley. And then this source of water, then over the centuries, uh, is used to create this fantastic chain of lakes running all the way down past the house and contributing to the setting of the house. Inspired by the formal gardens of the Palace of Versailles near Paris, the 17th century saw the water being channeled into decorative canals and fountains. It was that landscape which Capability Brown, England's most famous landscape gardener, transformed in the mid-18th century, as archivist Kate Harris explains. Brown's big idea was to turn everything into a natural-looking landscape park. So when he came in the middle of the 18th century, he swept away all the formal gardens um, that were created by the first Viscount and maintained under the second Viscount and brought up to the fashionable Rococo taste. He swept that all away and we just have a pastoral little. That meant woods, rolling meadows and, of course, tranquil expanses of water. Capability Brown was a remarkable man. And he did it with very simple techniques. He didn't have the ability to use anything mechanical. It's all done by hand. Uh, so it's digging it out, shifting each amount of uh, earth into a cart, uh, then taking it away to move it to a dam. Very, very labor intensive. There must have been hundreds of men employed. Phenomenal achievement. Most of the work was done by 1800, but following in Brown's footsteps 50 years later, England's second most famous landscaper arrived on the scene, Humphrey Repton. He regarded water as a very important part of the landscape. He writes of the appearance and glitter of water as being really important to the beauty of the scenery. Those are more or less his words in the Red Book. So it's a very, very important element. And he illustrates it in the Red Book with little yachts on it. It's what he calls a, a reant landscape, a jolly and peopled landscape that is appropriate to the house. Repton used to jot down his plans in a closely guarded notebook, but we'll sneak a look in it later on. I've come down to the hottest part of the safari park with keeper Sophie Dunn to help out with the morning routine here in the Butterfly House. So, Sophie, what's the first job of the day in here? Well, the very, very first thing we have to do is go to the emerging case and check the butterflies and see who's been born overnight and let them out so that they oh, can... Oh, exciting. Uh, so, literally, literally, you'll go to sleep yeah. and they'll just be... What, what do you call the little... The pupa hanging here on the sticks. They'll, overnight, they'll come out of there, hopefully. Normally, if we're lucky, we get quite a lot. It looks like this morning we've got quite a few So what's there. this one with, the, with those startling kind of blue this, inside Yeah, rooms? that's the blue morpher. OK. We ha they're quite a common one in the garden. And also we have the owl. It looks as though in there, ready to come out. The owl Is that the one with the... It looks like an owl's eye almost on its side there. It is, yeah, that's the there. one. It's quite huge. Hopefully, they'll all fly out. Let's see, we might need to encourage some of them. Of course, but wow, there's one. There they go. 
Um, let me just incredible. have a look, I oh, believe. Look at oh. that <laughs> on your lip. Is that a. <laughs> That's not <laughs> usual, but <laughs> he obviously likes me. It's Justin. Can we have a closer look at that? Yes. His wings look a tiny bit damaged because sometimes when they're not ready, they come out the pupa and they hang underneath and they're not quite dry when they fall down. So we have to leave them in there to dry a little while. He looks a little damaged. But right. I think but they he'll should be, a, be able to do you, do you oh, think yes, he'll, he'll be fine. He'll... We tend to pop them up over here in the warm, on the wall. Okay. Just so they let them let their wings. And literally let their wings yeah. dry out more. Look at there's another another one with, yeah, um, with blue ones there. That one's who's been there for a while. He's a blue Excellent. Morpher. So apart from opening up this, what's the mm -hmm. what's the next job of the day? Next job is the watering. So I don't know if you want to bring that camera. Ooh, down, lucky me, you? I get I get to, get to do some watering. Yeah. Don't do that at home very often. <laughs> You're very lucky. <laughs> so you have obviously a whole plethora of different flowers and things here. Are there, uh, oh, look at this one here. Yeah, that's the lantana there. That's a fabulous nectar plant that we have, which that's the Heliconus butterfly there. They all adore it. All the butterflies in the garden love the uh, nectar plants, the lantana especially. So you have almost a complete ecosystem in here, presumably because it's very, it's very humid, isn't it? Is, it? So it is, is there yeah. a specific temperature that you maintain in here? Well, we try and keep it about 30, 35, so right. it's quite warm, yeah, 85 Fahrenheit. So. And presumably all of this gardening takes quite a lot of work. It does. First thing in the morning, we come in here for about an hour, an hour and a half, right. try and get everything done. You can see a tree nymph there yes, on the lantana again. Just How many different that. types of butterfly do you have in here? Oh, we think we have about 20, 25 species at the moment. Right. And uh, you've got over 100 flying, about 100 to 150 flying. So, uh, so that one, is it actually taking nectar from...? It is, it is. It's uh, putting its proboscis in there. Like It's like a little tube of nectar, really, for it. So it's and what's the one with see-through yeah. wings just next to it? Do you That's know that the glass one? wing, yes. Yeah. I'd like to show you this one up here, I've just noticed. <gasps> that one? Uh, yeah, is that's that, is new. That... We've been waiting for that one to happen. It looks actually. like it's pretend. It looks like a, a cardboard cutout. No, it's the Madagascan moon moth, it's called. And if you see the chrysalis at the top there, the silvery white net-like one. That's what it came out of? Yeah. I've never seen one of those before because I'm, you know, I've not been here long and I've, that's the first one I've seen. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's absolutely it's got amazing. It's like long legs there and everything. It's like opening a Christmas stocking each morning when it you come is, in here, definitely. seeing all the different, um, the new arrivals. That's what it is. Sophie, thank you very much. That's okay. I think we'd better continue with our pruning and our watering. Come on, should we go down this way? Earlier on, we met the new young male otter in Pet's Corner, and now I've come down to see how he's getting on with Rosie, along with head of section Darren Beasley and keeper Bev Allen. I just love the fact that he's sitting and kind of curling his tail yeah. around her. It's just like putting his arm around uh, the, her. The first few hours they were in together, he was trying to groom her. He was just trying to clean her ears and just generally say how friendly he was. You know, he's a, he's a new boy in town. And she, of course, she loved it. She loved the attention. And, and, and Bev was saying she was watching the other day, and already she sits and... Uh, Rosie sits and juggles the stones. Yeah. He's already there. He's getting involved he's in the action. Yeah. 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 yeah, straight away. And, and she's not Bev kind of playing the kind of vicious housewife. She's not sort of bullying him too oh, much. No, I think she's sort of showing him the ropes, really, because everywhere she goes, he'll follow. And right. she's, like, sort of giving him a few hints and, you know, where the best spots off and where the food's hidden and things like that. Yeah. But, yeah, she's getting on really well. She's been really nice to him. And I, I still think she, he feels a bit lost around, sort of now and then, but he's getting there. Yeah. He's getting there. Yeah. And any signs of uh, love in the air? Love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, to be honest, he's still a little bit too young. Right. Um, certainly within the first 24 hours, he has tried to, to make her already. Um, and I do understand that, you know, it's, it's all new smells and it's all, of you know, course. it's exactly what we want. Yeah. The even more interesting for us or, or pleasing news is she didn't mind at all. So, right. I mean, that's great. And, and who knows, a year, two years, we, we hopefully have some baby otters. Now, of course, the big question is, and this is to both of you, have you come up with a name for him yet? Uh, um, yeah. A few. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, we can't <laughs> I think you're going to have to watch this space. Um, Bev's got some really good ideas. I've got some ideas. The, the other keepers have got ideas. Is um, any, any, any firm favourites yet? Bev, what, what would you um, like? Rosie and Jim. 
Oh, yeah. See, that would be perfect. <laughs> Lovely. I like cider, because cider with rosy, obviously, and it's an, yeah. a nice one. But then there is an argument for uh, their Southeast Asian chalk law daughters. It should be a Southeast Asian name, but no. I'm never going to be able to pronounce that, <laughs> nor will I. <laughs> I we'll, we'll get something over the next few days, I think. Okay, as long as there isn't a boxing match to decide. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to referee it. We've made up. We've made up. Well, yeah. congratulations, because he's absolutely gorgeous. Look at him. It's brilliant. Just great to see two otters back here again. When Humphrey Repton arrived at Longleat 200 years ago, it was the age of the Romantic poets. When William Wordsworth wandered lonely as a cloud and saw a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Fifty years earlier, in the 1750s, Capability Brown had swept away the formal gardens and now, as land agent Tim Moore recounts, Repton wanted to add a more intimate touch. He wanted a landscape that was more romantic, uh, more there for pleasure. And he does, in some of his comments uh, about uh, others, and principally Brown, he's saying the Brown sort of landscape is practical. Where you have a building in, a brown land, in Brown's landscape, it's a cottage or a barn. It does something. He said, well, we shouldn't have that. We're, we've moved beyond that. Uh, my uh, clients demand not barns and cottages. They want beautiful things in the landscape. They want temples and uh, grottos and uh, buildings that reflect the romanticism of the countryside, not its utilitarian use. As well as being a gardener, Repton was also a skilled artist and used a famous red notebook to lay out his ideas. Archivist Kate Harris has brought it up from the library. It's basically a very, very grand sales pitch. Not all his suggestions were taken up. Many of them, are, in fact, we're grateful that they weren't taken up because he much was fonder of a very domesticated landscape. But Repton's proposals for making the house more imposing by changing Half Mile Lake were acted upon. I think the most important change that Repton made to the water at Longleat must be the change to the Half Mile Island Lake, um, where he lowers the water level so that one can appreciate the drama of the house rising more dramatically above the lake. Um, and this illustration, illustration eight in the sequence in the Red Book, shows a before and after view with what he intends, shown underneath the flap with the tributary river, the appearance of a tributary river going towards the boathouse and the house rising dramatically above the water. I think the before and after is a very, very sophisticated sales pitch. <laughs> The second Marquis agreed to pay nearly one and a half million pounds in today's money to create the view of the house we see today. The work wasn't carried out until 1813. We've got stewards' accounts that tell us that well over two thousand pounds was spent then. What they were doing, I was spending money on navigators' work, which is basically to dig out what was the former portico pond, to increase the height of the house above the water, and also to give um, the effect of a natural conflux of two streams, what he calls it. So they created that, if you like, tribu tributary to the main area of the natural river as an explanation for why the lake is so very narrow up at the waterfall end and widens out to such an extent at the far end. Repton also tried to disguise the artifice behind the, inverted commas, natural river by creating an island. So what they did was take a great bite out of what's called Hazel Copse Mead um, and create the island where we now have the gorillas. 200 years later, the man-made lakes look as though they've been here forever. Just as the designers intended, estate manager Tim Moore finds them a great source of enjoyment. Looking back at the origins of the lakes here, and if you look at Capability Brown and then at Repton, they create water for pleasure, whereas before, it would have been the Marquis of Bath and his family may be going out in a little skiff or a sailing boat for, um, you know, their personal pleasure. So it's like the rest of Longleat, really. Lord Bath 
and his father, by opening it up to the public, has shared what was purely private family enjoyment with thousands of people. Probably had as much fun in the last five minutes as I have for quite some time. It's a long time since I fed the sea lions, very long time. It's the end of a beautiful summer's day here in Monkey Jungle, and Kate and I have joined Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner. And what is more English than strawberries? Just look at that. So I, I can't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're not for you. Go. They're for the monkeys, apparently. I mean, the, quality the control, monkeys love quality me. Control, yeah. <laughs> I, give, um, I, I give it my, um, my pass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're going to be all right. So should we start chucking them out yep. here? And, uh, Anywhere down this area. Down come this area. Oh, once they, come to us quite once they see coming over... I okay. see a few strawberries going over there's there. Some, there's a couple over there. That's going okay. on. Is there, is there anyone in particular who's likely to um Timothy come first? likes strawberries. Who is Timothy? How Timothy's can a large you dominant possibly male. Possibly tell the difference does, between because them all. You'll see when he comes over. Oh look, look, they're all coming really fast. Come on, monks. And Timothy, is he the sort of the alpha male? Is He's he a the dominant male? Right. Fact, can you, can no. you spot him yet? Is that him? Is that him there? Just down here, look. See that? The one with about three strawberries. <laughs> <just going off. laughs> Running around. Now, I mean, is this good for them, all these? I mean, do, do uh, monkeys suffer if they eat too much fruit the same way that humans do? Might they get the runs? They, they occasionally can do, but literally, they, they'll just grab them in their pouches now. Yeah. You can see that one there. He's got three there. One in each hand, <laughs> one in either side. And, then and when you say in the pouches, off. do they literally hold them in their mouth until later and then yeah, enjoy them? In the wild, you've got to eat fast and then and run off. Right. You know, because otherwise somebody else comes on, you lose out. And especially with the number of monkeys. How many yeah, yeah. monkeys are living there's, here? There's 77 adults plus loads of babies. Wow. And they seem to breed all year round, yeah. is that right? That's why, yeah. So you've got babies at any time of year? Yeah, there's, there's one just over there. I can see it just there's on the front. There's a tiny, yeah, tiny little one. He's, look at the mother. <laughs> can you see how much her pouch is <laughs> really swollen up, isn't it? She's coming over now, look. Oh, yeah. Oh, look would, the, would the young ones eat, um, either, the really young ones, yeah. like the one that's oh, on her, a bit her of food. They like a bit of banana when they first start off, but strawberries they like, and it's a change. Mm -hmm. It's not something they get every day, so. Yeah, yeah. It's not something we get every day, <laughs> strawberries. <laughs> Bit of I know, it's, it's feeling slightly kind of um, <laughs> wicked, this, throwing out these beautiful straw be asking, strawberries, the a whole bucket <laughs> yeah. of them. <laughs> Well, Ian, I think I want to be a monkey living in the monkey jungle. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think I, I will be. <laughs> I think you've eaten more than the monkeys have. This bucket has gone down very fast. Ian, thank you very, very much. Thank it's you. always lovely to see them. Sadly, that's all we've got time for today, so it's goodbye from Animal Park. Mm -hmm.